Okay, so our tank, you guys know that we bought this thing out of a swamp and we don't even know what it is. Like, I have no idea. So before we tear into it too much and do any more damage, just gotta try and figure out what we have, what parts it needs. And that's the tricky part is because I really don't even know what we have. It's not anything that you guys have mentioned online. Hey, what are you doing here? Um, I was sitting by my desk and I heard the anguished cries of a tank that needed tensioning. So I thought I'd come down and do a little bit of work. Do you have anything bigger than this? It's absolutely pathetic. I'm Nick, by the way, I go by the sheep dog. Okay, well, nice to meet you. <laughs> here we go. it to dig black muck and the thing sat for 10 years and fired right up. So the coolest thing is the steering wheel actually works. It's connected to the tracks. <laughs> in the name of St. George have they done to that tank? We have come to the Ontario Regiment Museum so you can have a look at what your thing looked like or was supposed to look like. Doing 20 mile an hour in this thing on the road is actually scary. scary. Okay, so maiden voyage. We're gonna grease it. You know, we want to do proper maintenance on our stuff. Let's see if we can make this an easy driving experience. I think we have a hole in our radiator back there, so we'll top that up. I wasn't sure if it was a Detroit, but just driving it up and down the driveway here a little bit, starting to leak oil everywhere too. So <laughs> we're gonna take it to some uncharted territories, find a way through the bush and see how we make out. Here we go. Now this transmission is just a four or a five speed with no overdrive so if we were to upgrade to an overdrive transmission we could probably get it up to i don't know 35 mile an hour something like that right now we could stick this in bull low and that in bull low and we could pull a house down i'm sure hey chevy tail i wonder if that's off this track the hydraulic glide looks like water to me but anyway Transmission was a little low. We got one fill port on the side of the transmission. And then we've got one for each final drive. So we'll pull that plug and make sure that the final drives are full. Fuel oil is wet in there. Yeah, we got oil. We're all set. She's in good shape. Whoever thought of this did not think this through very good. Well, that's our level. Must have been a bullet. German. So that's quite the hole. You ever hear the trick with the eggs? Yeah? Yeah. Eggs How? or pepper? Eggs and pepper? Or pepper. Oh. Yeah. How many eggs? I would think two. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking two. There's a, there's a chicken coop over there. Do you mind grabbing a couple eggs? That should do it. <laughs> Oh yeah, I just bubble gum it up and let's go. Yeah. You got some bubble gum? Do you, do you, no, I didn't bring any gum with me. Crack the eggs or do you just throw them in? <laughs> throw them in with the shells? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought maybe Vince could weld that hole up for you. Yeah, I've done it before, but it ain't fun. <laughs> <laughs> He's already said no to me. <laughs> I'm not welding that. <laughs>
Probably okay to go through here. I don't know what's underneath this swamp or how deep it is. This is a creek and then this time of year it's about to dry as, as, as it gets. The issue is if we get stuck we're gonna spend a day or two to get us back out again. We have to cut a bunch of trees down for Kevin's tractor to be able to come back. In a day or two's time I think we can pull the cab off, put the bigger engine in the back so at least we have power and then maybe put that four cylinder in the front with a hydraulic pump and a winch. I'm sure VNR's got a massive winch. That way, if we get stuck, we can just winch ourselves out rather than being idiots and going through here. Or we could just drive through here and pretend that we don't think things through. <laughs> Either way, the train bridge is super cool. These are the tracks that make it to the front of my house but uh, I don't think we can fit through there. I think we're 10 feet wide and I don't think, and I, I wouldn't be surprised it kind of curls around at the bottom. So I don't think we can make that. All right guys, if you don't know who this is, this is Nick, uh, AKA the Chieftain, the internet's resident tank expert. <laughs> uh, one of them, but a lot, I like to think I hold my own. You saw our little video there and some people recommended you come down and yeah, take a look. Okay, so uh, you know, what in the name of St. George have they done to that tank. And it's kind of like, it's a travesty. It's a, oh my God. It's pretty cool. It, it is very cool. 
I've got good news and I've got bad news. Okay. The good news is that was never a tank. Okay, good. Thank God. The bad news is, um, do you know the way when you put something, take something apart and you put it back together and there's always a couple of pieces, pieces left over? Yeah. Yeah, imagine you did that with a whole bunch of tanks and then you looked at all the bunches of pieces you had left over and said, I got a great idea. That is what you have. So, so what you're saying is that is extremely rare and extremely valuable. It is extremely rare. <laughs> right, so things that this tank is not other than being a real tank. So there, there are a couple of interesting suggestions and I have to say I thought about them as well when I first saw the vehicle until I came up close and I realized this was a bespoke custom built hull. Yeah. Honestly, I don't know why they didn't just use a regular M4 hull. I guess they were just trying to keep their weight down. So the spacing of the bogies, this is a horizontal volute spring suspension system. Uh, the earlier VVSS, these volute springs were vertically mounted and they gave you a little bit less range of motion. So these are also known as the E8 suspension units. They look fairly similar to the Alvis Chalmers suspension unit, as you find on, let's say, an M6 high-speed tractor, but the wheels are definitely different, and actually, the, if you look closely, the suspension unit is different as well. Don't bother counting the return rollers because this is just a completely novel suspension system. We think even that's why they didn't even bother with the shock absorbers on the HVSS, because it looks like it'll interfere with where the rollers go. Now, if you look at the back end of it, you might think, oh, this is similar to a Pershing, or this is similar to some of the self-propelled artillery pieces like the M40. Yes, it would be similar. Again, though, your difference is the back end of this was not a real vehicle. So the regular M4 idle wheel is much higher, so you have a, a straight return run. Well, they didn't even do that with the front end with the sprocket. So for those of you thinking this was originally an artillery piece, no evidence of that at all, I'm afraid, either. Now, it is possible that maybe the idler was originally built for an artillery piece and then got put onto this thing. Uh, but generally speaking, that was the whole point of the American designs in World War II, was that you tried to use as few different types of components as possible on as many different vehicles as possible, just to reduce the amount of supplies that you needed to ship overseas to keep things going. These are basically disposable parts. People saying M4A3, M4A2, Yes, the Canadians were heavy users of the M4A2. Again, though, this wasn't an M4A2 hull. The engine is no longer an M4A2. That had the twin GM diesel. The only original thing about this is really the nose. Uh, so what happened is that there, there's this industry after the war, basically, of converting vehicles. Uh, what was it? Swords to plowshares. A lot of people would think, hey, tank, it's great for moving heavy things around or for dragging plows or doing things. Not really, because tanks were designed more for burst speeds, not for continuous low track, you know, continuous tractive effort. But it's better than nothing in a lot of situations. There's a couple of companies out in Western Canada, out, out in the BC area. Uh, Mado would have been one, Washington Ironworks would have been one, there might have been a couple of others. They would create lumber equipment using tank chassis, or in this case, tank components. So what it looks like to me is that I suspect Mado is the manufacturer of this specific one. They built a hull of their own and they put whatever components that they needed to get this thing to, to drive around a hillside in British Columbia. The entire differential, uh, control differential steering system in the front and that armored section, I mean, that's the only armor on the tank, okay. is that nose piece. Right, yeah. So that is genuine steel armor. It knocks trees over pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we'll do that. <laughs> then it comes through the drives, through the final drives, to the sprockets, and they have the correct tank track type. But I don't even know if they got the right amount of links. I mean, so ordinarily, I'll tell you to do track maintenance. We can go around, we can, we, can, we can discuss how you maintain one of these things. But I couldn't even tell you what the correct level of track tension is supposed to be on this because there's no manual. At least I presume there's no manual. I, I looked in the glove box and it is no, not there, nothing. no, no. I am curious though as to how on earth you managed to get the transmission and steering to work from a body that's six feet above where it's supposed to be. <laughs> Two cases of beer in one afternoon. You're joking. <laughs> no, pretty much. There was another I-beam welded here and they cut that off and then they put their own steering suspension on there. So they just put my arm off of a normal CK pick up and then when you go back it pulls pushes on the one and when you turn the wheel the other way it lifts up and it puts the brake on on the other side so originally of course you just had two tillers they're yeah. centrally located you pull back pull back the other but yeah that, that would be where the connector is and your gearbox how do you reach a clutch pedal 
So I mean, this is manual transmission. It's a manual transmission. I can't see a clutch linkage on this, meaning there's no way to disconnect this transmission from this final drive. When you drive a tank and you want to get up to full speed, do you cycle through all the gears? Well, you start a second, but yeah. Okay, second, yeah. So we never got it fast enough to get any rolling speed to be able to get into the next gear. I would not be courageous enough to get this fast enough to get up the rolling speed <laughs> okay, to so the next what gear. what would happen but... with loose tracks that are not maintained properly and we go too fast? Uh, well, then you throw a track. And yeah, so but then you just stop on that side and do a quick spin and then there she sits. Uh, that, that is the effect, yes. Yeah. Uh, the track stops and you'll, you'll do a rotation. And then you have to get the track back on. So my next question to you is, if you don't have the big wrench for tightening it, do you have the track jacks for taking the track apart and putting it back together? We have excavators and we have some bulldozers and some chains and pulling and, and, and that. It's, yeah. So what a track jack does is it kind of, uh, it hooks onto each side of the outside end connector. Let's yep. say your brake is here. Yep. And these end connectors in the center guide to come off. The track jacks are used uh, like a clamp, a big C clamp, one on each side, yep. to bring the two together, and then you can hammer on the right, end connectors. Right, right. But unless you have some mechanism of doing that, you are not going to get this track back together. I mean, the other thing is, if you're going to run this any length of time, you've got no road wheel on your rubbers, you've lost your shock absorbers. Um, we have to check to make sure, you have to check each individual wedge bolt is still actually inside all, all the all the end connectors. If yep. one of those falls off, then, then you're hosed. Do yeah. I ask what the engine is? It is a 471 two-stroke Detroit, only 140 horsepower with a four-speed manual transmission. Two transmissions, so it's a transmission driving a transmission. Okay, well, there is precedent for that, that in the tank world, although it's usually a transfer case, so a high-range, low-range transfer case, and then your regular transmission okay. comes out of that. 140 horsepower. Well, okay, so the saving grace is, as a piece of logging equipment, this didn't have to go fast. Right. So you have Shark Nose Housing 629, it looks like. Okay. That's why you got an next one. Yeah. <laughs> you would never have found that number. <laughs> but that's not for the vehicle. That's, that is only for the housing. Yes. Turn it into a technical, like the, like, like the Toyotas in Chad. Put, put a heavy machine gun on the back deck. <laughs> if we do that, can we get it in any World of Tanks video games? I can ask. <laughs> How many likes on this video I'll to get that might, to happen? We might, you might. <laughs> If you want to get it up to any speed for any length of time, you, you, you probably would need to replace the road wheels. It is possible to get rubber track uh, if, you, if you want to throw a few dollars at it. These were designed from the start as being steel key. Oh, okay. It would be nice to get rubber tracks on it, but the only reason I see that is to put it in parades yeah. and um, drive to town. We can throw a hay bale in the back and put a slow moving vehicle sign on it, and legally we can drive that down the road. Again, it also comes down to your road authority. Believe it or not, especially in hot, uh, in colder weather, the, the cleats do less damage to the roads than rubber tracks do. Uh, oh, really? But a lot of road authorities will not will not look at the uh, look at that. They will just say, "We want rubber, not metal." Yes. End of story. Right. The cleats will actually just slide over yep. the tarmac. Right. Uh, you know, if it's hot and the tarmac is soft, that's another matter entirely. <laughs> but you will have a lot of that same problem with rubber as well, as it's gripping the track, as it does that spinning it, on, on right, the tarmac. Right. Kind of, I think. Probably the best way of getting you to understand how to operate one of these things is I happen to know a guy who happens to have a running Sherman that we can look at and we can do all the, this. Is, in Dunville? This is around the corner. You, we're we're going to have to drive a little bit. Come to the Ontario Regiment Museum. It's in Oshawa, other side of Toronto from you guys. So you can have a look at what your thing looked like or was supposed to look like as far as the designers of the components were concerned. Yeah. And immediately you're going to see things like the end connectors are all flush with the track. You'll see the road wheels are all rubber. That's weird. I am not 100% convinced. They're telling me that I need to replace all the idlers with ones that have rubber, but I'm still not 100% convinced that mine had rubber on it. 
because they, because this lip is not as big, or our lip is bigger. The inside I can see it, it, it it's and, fairly and decent. That's actually, but it's, yeah, well, my, it's a wear plate is what it is. So that's a piece of metal that's rubbing against the right guides here. So right. they, they had to reinforce that. That's right. a little bit thicker. It was not unusual for there to be some steel road wheels in World War II. They just weren't on Sherman's. But if you look at, uh, let's say, a German Jagdpanzer IV, it had rubber road wheels on the back, but because the thing was so nose heavy, the rubber on the front wheels was just getting ripped off. So they replaced them with just pure steel rimmed road wheels. And also rubber was a critical commodity in Germany. So they, they put the, ro the rubber was actually around the hub instead of on the outside. And oh. they had steel on the outside. It made a lot, a lot of friction, a lot of noise. Uh, but it at least provided some form of vibration cushioning for everything else. We have our shocks, hooray. You can see the springs are a little bit more compressed than they were before. Yeah, like mine, the shocks are already out, Yeah, which makes sense with the rubber being missing again. Yeah. Oh, that spring's going to be need replacement soon. Yes. But, uh, again, I'm, I'm here all day part. to point on everything yeah. that's broken. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, this isn't my tank, so I'm going to hand you over. Mike, we have guests for you. Can I drive this thing? Hi, how's it going? Good. Yeah, so you know these things? A little bit. A little yes. bit? Yeah. <laughs> right on. So my name is Mike Rashad and I'm a volunteer here at the Ontario Regiment Museum. We have a basis of probably 100 volunteers. Uh, I'm part of a crew that uh, look after the Shermans. My senior crazy tank truck. And uh, so with that, we can compare some stuff on it and uh, maybe we'll get you to turn some sticks and burn some fuel. <laughs> nice, awesome. It's a lot different than uh, than our little girl. So what we were trying to decide last night is we've got the the, the truck transmission at the back with the right. 471 with the drive shaft, but there's no clutch in between the transmission and the final drive in the front, correct? So it's the same thing. There's a clutch on the back of the engine. Right. It's another big drive shaft going straight to the back. Yeah. So we you got the clutches, and then you've got that transfer case that I was talking about. And it puts it yeah. into one drive so shaft. So this has the twin 671s. This, yeah, this is original. This is your lockout, so for your gate. You put that in, you go all the way over, and then straight down, Yeah. it's forward, straight back's reverse. Okay. And then you come across, and you got second, third, fourth, and fifth. Okay. The gears are pretty good. And it's a long throw, you can feel it like, um, yeah. It, <laughs> it works a little, push, push your clutch and it works a little better too. Um, there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That so that's, went in, yeah. that's second. That's third. That definitely feels like it's going in. That's not yeah, how. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. So, so if you can imagine, we have a we have a bar that goes around the shifter like this. Right. Right, and that connects. It, it's a big long bar that comes in. It's got a holder where it, where it pivots in, right? So it's able to rotate, and then it comes through the floor, and then the floor. So the bar comes up. It's got a big handle here. So we can we can lift the handle up and that does that does this and this. Right. But I only have reverse one, two, and three. I don't have four and five. And then because it it it's able to slide through that bar, it 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 pushes it forward and then you pull the handle back and it pulls the gear back. Right. But it doesn't have this solid like clunk where you know that it's and it's just it's just in like right about here. Right. And that's as far as it moves and the, and that's as far as it goes. So we need to uh, change that up. There. It, it, it shifts a little bit smoother too when it's running. Yeah, yeah. With these two tanks, because of their age, so like this one, the third gear synchro is pretty much non-existent. Okay. So we got to double clutch them. Sometimes you you'll nail it and just like it's just perfect. It's like <laughs> yeah. oh right I got it. Then you do the next thing you do the shift and you totally blow it right. <laughs> yeah. um, here we can catch fourth gear for like a couple seconds and we run in space. Yeah. You know, yeah, so yeah, then we're, yeah. we're okay, gearing down. Yeah. Uh, usually we just we just basically shift up to third and and. We bomb around third. Um, How fast do these go? Brand new. They're probably on, on the road. Brand new. Probably about 25 mile an hour. Doing 20 mile an hour in this thing on the road is actually scary. Scary. <laughs> it, it feels like you're doing 100. This is your throttle. Yeah. Um, so uh, your well, your fuel shut off basically, right? Your fuel control. So all the so way off the fuel. So like that's, the that's our engine kill. Oh, this is this your parking brake. <laughs> During wartime, you do like heavy, like you know, 30 mile, 40 mile road movements and stuff, or vibration and stuff. You could actually lock it in. So oh, so it's like cruise control. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's it's all based off of your fuel pedal as well. These are your clutch lockouts. So because it's twin engines, left engine, your right engine. 
So if you were if your engine went down, shove the clutch in, pull this out. So it just basically just connects that engine from the drive. But your good engine still functional. Yeah. It's functional, yeah, but it's exactly. but it's also now it's not dragging the dead engine too, right? Like originally they would have had a nine cylinder air cool. <laughs> not to give a big long story of Shermans, but basically when they originally started building the Shermans, their yep. earlier models. Uh, it was a nine-cylinder uh, Continental radial engine. Yeah. What happened was, uh, as the production really started going and the war started really kicking off, there's different theories, but the, the, the reason that I buy the most is that uh, the war effort, the, the air effort, they needed those radials for the bombers and for, right. and for airplanes. So they had to start sourcing other engines. And that's probably the point too, where the other uh, two of the big three car manufacturers really got into, into the uh, manufacturing of Shermans and they all kind of went their own way with engines. So any of the Shermans, they, they have like manufacturing numbers. Uh, so like this one is an A2. Any A2 Sherman has the twin diesels. Okay, the A3s, they were the Fords and they went with a massive V8 gas engine. And it's, the, it's called the Ford TAA. It's the biggest production V8 ever built. Uh, it's something like 18.5 liter V8. <laughs> we need that for yeah. a car. Yeah. It's, it's a monster. <laughs> is, that a, is that an expensive engine? Yeah. We'd like to put that in like an A car or something. <laughs> yeah. 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 I love how they're ambitious with a 60 mile an hour. <laughs> I think it was just a standard, standard, uh, in the Shermans they never looked at, they never looked at the speedometer anyway. <laughs> for the start procedure, make sure it's out of gear. Yep. Okay. And then to your left, you got power on, that red light should come on. Turn the key on. Where's the key? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you got the power on. Yep. Okay. And you got it out of gear. Okay, out of gear. Gonna, now you're gonna do your fuel. So you're gonna just push it down to just kind of feel the detent. There's the detent. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Push the clutch in. Okay, hey, look over, you got two starter buttons. Yep. Low, down, down. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And then do the other one. <laughs> Your generator runs off a belt right yep. here. Yeah. Yep. We just did a refresh on this. Yeah. So I haven't sat here since it's been running. It's like, this thing's going really quiet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds like Detroit. You want to yeah. move? Okay, so clutch in. Yeah. Okay, push the button in. Hold the button in to open the gate up. Go all the way over to your side. And yep. then back is reverse. Okay, yeah. we'll go forward. And right? That's slow gear, yeah. Yeah. Now you got the crazy part, you gotta unlock the tillers. Oh, okay. Okay, so there's a little little tab there. Yep. Push it down, all right. Pull yep. one tiller back, let it go. Oh, Pull yeah. one tiller back, let it go. Ah, oh, there we go. And just uh, let the clutch out, give us some fuel. great engine guy and the best part about Chris as the engine guy is he's amazing at lifting the engine hatches. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll make a deal you to get the turret. I'll lift the hatches. <laughs> I think that'd be a really good job for you to swing your turret. Sure. <laughs> I'm just uh, gonna say yes gonna to everything. Pass this stuff off, <laughs> so we're gonna go up and climb into the commander's hatch. Okay. So way down there in the gunner's seat. So so way down. So on your right hand side you'll see a tea lever by your elbow. Keep right. going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. There it goes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, come on up. You want to see how heavy those hatches are? <sighs> nice. Oh. Just drop them. You're gonna put your finger. <laughs> Holy smokes! Yeah. Oh wow. So they're not ambidextric. There's a left and a right because you've got intakes on the outside and exhaust on the inside. This winter we pulled both engines out. Yeah. And it's only one location for the starter. It's not, you can't put a starter uh, on. I was like, really? Yeah, just because of the space, right? Most heavy duty engines, you put a starter on whatever side you want, right? Right, right. You could take the head off, flip it 180 degrees, drop it off, and it'll run. Yeah. No kidding. Because over here where the supercharger is, you got two inspection ports on either end. Right. In the center four. Yeah. Supercharger. It's leaking oil. Detroit didn't think Detroit's leaking oil. <laughs> But there's nothing you can do here. It's like, oh, it's broken. It's like, yep, yeah, it's broken. So they're two engines and then they go uh, to a, a 
transfer case, and then it's one shaft going to the front to the transmission. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Two engines, two clutches. Yeah, the two clutches is really strange. I don't know why they wouldn't do one clutch on the other end of the transfer case. But the real reason is so they, if you lose an engine, yeah, you, you can, can declutch it and um, have it locked out. Right. 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 Yeah, but uh, it and seems also like, start the other one. It seems start. like so much extra work because when you're adjusting the clutches, it's a nightmare. Right. Because you, like when we did that one, you and your tachometers because they're cable driven. Yeah. It's like that's 500 ish. <laughs> so if one's grabbing more than the other or comes off first, you're going to roast the other one, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And on top of that, if you're uh, trying to pull away, you're pulling away on the power of one engine, right? Yeah. So before you get the clutch all the way up, you'll probably stall this engine before the tank moves, right? <laughs> oh. Yeah, yeah, and that's, we've been down that road. Yeah. <laughs> it's soccer experience. Yeah. Right? They have their own individual uh, fuel system, but there's an equalizing line that runs from the bottom of each reserve tank across the back. So you always have the same amount of fuel on each side. But if we go to that system where you've got to block the clutch out and you only run an engine, you can take fuel from the entire tank. Right, right. So, smart. So when you pull the motors, you got to come straight out? There's a bit of disassembly, like you take off these okay. grates, it comes out with the transfer case. Mm -hmm. So you get kind of a funky moment where you got to kind of kick the back end up, it kind of come out like this. And then once it clears just, this yeah. section here, <laughs> you're, you're out. Just, just <laughs> never straight up. You're yeah. just like, oh, yeah. just, you know, what, like, yeah. we're going to save two inches. To pull it. There's a uh, two-stroke generator, uh, home light generator, they, they call it the Little Joe. It's designed to uh, run all the electrics oh, in the tank. Yeah. when the tank's not running. Yeah. So if they're on station, you know, on watch at night, whatever, uh, they want to run the power turret, the lights, or that kind of stuff, they can run that little Joe instead of running the, the main engines, as well as it, it'll also charge the batteries up. Uh, so if they, the batteries are dead, they can fire that up, yeah. have a smoke and a coffee, and hopefully yeah. charge the batteries. Yeah. Now, you can direct that, the heat off of that, go into the battery box to keep the batteries uh, warm when the, when the tank is parked, and that really does a good job of heating the tank up when the tank is sitting. So you do kind of have a heat system or a heat source if you want to use it, right? That cap right there, that's the, that's the one for the little Joe. Yeah. So it's just right below that inside the, inside the finding apartment. That fire pole, what's yeah, that? It's, it's like an extinguisher powder system. Um, the bottles you can't see, they're down underneath, and there's two flute uh, nozzles, and they'll spray and flood this compartment. But not inside the cap, like just no, engine? No, okay, it's, yeah. it's the engine compartment. Okay. Now, that's two 6V71s. I don't understand how you get 30 cylinders in, in line six? No. The, the Chrysler, the, That's the, gas. the third, yeah, the multi-pack. How the hell do you get 30 cylinders in here in a circle? Start in, yeah, so it's, it, it looks just like the, the Chrysler pentagram uh, thing. Really? So yeah, you got a head like this, head like this, and two like that. Huh, there must be dry sump or something to, to get oiling. Yeah, there's only one sump for the oil. Okay. Yeah. You can always tell the multi-tank one because the row wheels, they, there's a big space between it because they had to stretch that hull a lot farther. <laughs> it's funny. Cool engine, the fact that once they got the bugs worked out of it, it was, it was really durable. <laughs> yeah. <It's> just... <laughs> That's awesome. But now extremely rare? Do you, are, are there a lot yeah, of them around? Or... They, they're around, but they are rare in the fact that I, uh, by the end of the war, museums like, like ours or whatever, right, people would get a multi-bank they jerk that engine and put something else in because everything you had to do, you had to pull the engine. And if you're in a museum that works on a, like a small budget, yeah. you can't afford your thing to tune that tank up, you gotta pull the engine, right? They, but they were smart enough to not toss them, they're on a shelf somewhere. Mm, no, really? Yeah, yeah. So really? Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, a lot of stuff, you'd be surprised at the stuff that went. But, but people inherited these after the war, it was like getting your dad's 1988 Chevy pickup and it meant nothing to you, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was, exactly. there was that's a really good way to put there it. There was 128,000 of them and this one meant nothing. So you jerked everything out, scrapped it and stuck it somewhere so people can look at it. All right, you remember the starting procedure? Yeah, so. Uh, Some master power behind you. Master power, just lights the, on. Just the 24 volt, yeah. Yeah, um, this cool. is uh, just the 24, yeah, the top yeah. one. And then these are free. Yeah. So then you want to clutch in. Clutch in. Start one. Yeah. Starting oh, wait, one. Sorry, throttle. Oh yeah. Starting one. Yep. There you go. Starting two. It's not running. Yeah, the third engine the gauge. There you go. There we go.
This was about as fast as we could go yeah, yeah. In, in, our, in the truck tank. Yeah. This is truck tank speed. I found something, well, a little bit better okay. than what you had. So, yeah, track tension. The most important part of my life. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, Nick, I appreciate you guys. You're coming down, showing me my neighbors, and uh, found, made some new friends today. Uh, I think this, this is a lovely wonderland, isn't it? Yeah, and, and I think I'm going to go start wrenching on some tanks, too. So I really do appreciate you coming down and taking the yeah, effort. Go. Definitely check out Chieftain. Um, anything and everything tanks, Pretty Texas. Much armor history, uh, doctrine, vehicle reviews. The, some people call me the Doug DeMuro of tanks. Oh, nice. Which I, I don't know if that's a good thing or not. I was about to say that, but, <laughs> <laughs> but that's awesome. I hope you got some inspiration for your thing. Does it have a name yet? All right, so that was a lot of footage space over a long period of time, but we want full edited videos with a beginning and a conclusion to each one, which is why it took so long to get a tank video out. In the process, we've done a pile of work to this thing, and, and we'll let you guys decide what we kind of have been working on, on the chassis itself, on the truck itself, but all those videos will be on DGHC. That's getting edited right now, but there is bonus footage of us driving this thing in 360 camera. So if you watch it on your cell phone, you can turn your cell phone and get 360 view of everything. Our reactions of this thing almost tipping over, knocking trees over. It was a lot of fun trying to shift it and get it into gear. Uh, thank you for all the truck names. I think we're stuck on Shermanator. Uh, we're 90s kids and American Pie, you can put it together. We're not married to the truck itself, so we might be changing the bodies later on or doing some neat things with it afterwards but uh, we will be using the truck for now. We're almost at 100,000 subscribers on DGHD, so tell your friends, subscribe there, that helps us out, and uh, look forward to more videos. The transfer truck has come a long, long way. I'm working on kind of everything in the background. Those videos are just being edited right now, but there is footage of us driving it. So remember, get out there and work on it, because if you're not filthy, you're not rich. Here we go. <laughs>